that which this vile city has used to intoxicate the nations of the world, but also because of their religious involvement in that harlot church that will ultimately be destroyed and focus its attentions and affections on the Antichrist alone. So the people of the earth will place their faith in the Antichrist. And the imaginary, inexhaustible resources that he offers them, they will assume that his empire possesses unlimited resources, evidenced by the mark of the beast that they will wear. Do we not already see this in our country where masses of people expect the government to care for them? And politicians know how to buy their votes by spending unimaginable amounts of money as if there is an endless supply. And we are now experiencing, for example, unprecedented deficits in our country. In fact, since January, I, I read just yesterday, the national debt in America has quadrupled to around $12 trillion with no end in sight. So, in verse 3, the purpose of the judgment will be because all the nations have drunk of the wine of the passion of her immorality. And then it goes on to say, and the kings of the earth have committed acts of immorality with her, and the merchants of the earth have become rich by the wealth of her sensuality. That could also be translated because of the power of her wantonness. Power. Dynameos in the original language. It is a term that could be translated power or wealth. And it implies here that the vast wealth and luxury of Babylon will be the energizing force that will make the kings and the merchants fabulously wealthy. In fact, the term sensuality, which can also be translated wantonness, describes the sheer insolence and arrogance and self-indulgence that will characterize the inhabitants of the city and of the people of the world. The people will not only be blasphemous idolaters, but they will also be utterly consumed with pride because of their wealth and their lavish lifestyles. And historically, this has always characterized people who are fabulously wealthy, especially the political and religious elite. So, dear friends, we have before us history waiting to be revealed, waiting to come to fruition. Amazing. A, a detailed account of where the world is heading. A world that is staggering around in a drunken stupor. A world that is like a man who is inebriated. Only here it is inebriated with Wealth, and yet its appetite is never satisfied. It's always wanting yet another drink of something that will satisfy that insatiable lust for more. Compare this with the attitude that God requires according to James 5 and verse 1 where we read, Come now, you rich, weep and howl for your miseries which are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted and your garments have become, moth, become moth-eaten. Your gold and your silver have rusted and their rust will be a witness against you and will consume your flesh like fire. It is in the last days that you have stored up your treasure. Behold the pay of the laborers who mowed your fields and which has been withheld by you cries out against you. And the outcry of those who did the harvesting has reached the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. You have lived luxuriously on the earth and led a life of wanton pleasure. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. Beloved, in closing this morning, I wish to challenge you with these thoughts. It is easy for us, even as Christians, to yield to this temptation of wanting more, never being satisfied, never being content. The affluent culture in which we live pushes this upon us constantly. 
I often think how interesting it is that they change the models of the cars just a little bit every year so that you look at your car and you can see it just doesn't measure up to the new model. And on and on it goes. And very subtly, we can allow our love for Christ to be eclipsed by a love for things. A sin that is so easily verified by just examining our spending habits, our ship, our patterns of giving even within the church. Very quickly we can see where we lay up our treasure. Is it on earth or is it in heaven? Paul warns in 1 Timothy 6 verse 10, but those who want, which literally means eagerly desire, those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a snare and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into ruin and destruction. Let me pause there. Think of all the ways this can happen. All of the Ponzi schemes, all of the get-rich-quick programs that are out there. Gambling, playing the lottery, which is nothing more than a tax on the poor and the ignorant. Paul goes on to say, for the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil. And some, by longing for it, have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many a pang. Well, dear friends, Satan will use man's obsession for riches to lure him into worshiping the Antichrist. And one day, that whole wicked system will come crashing down. I challenge you this morning with another way, God's way, where he pleads with us to lay up our treasures in heaven, not on earth. You see, dear friends, our focus needs to be on our need for the forgiveness of sin. Our focus needs to be on being reconciled to a holy God. Our focus needs to be on the glorious gospel of Christ where we understand that we must trust in the Lord Jesus Christ as our only hope of salvation. The one who bled and died on a cross of Calvary as a substitute for our sins. That we might have his righteousness as he took upon himself our sin. For this reason the Lord said in Luke 9 verse 23. If anyone wishes to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life shall lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake, he is the one who will save it. For what is a man profited if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? Let's pray together. Father, thank you for these truths that cause us to examine more closely our own hearts. Lord, I pray especially for those that do not know you, that today would be the day they confess their sin and come running to you as their Savior. Lord, I pray that you will use these truths to stir our hearts. I pray that you will use them to fan the embers of our affections of you into full flame. Lord, I pray that, that you will use what we've studied today to cause our hearts to glow red hot with an ardent zeal for evangelism. Lord, give us afresh the excitement of this certain hope that we have that you are coming again. Lord, encourage us to live in the light of your glory and your grace. And Lord, may we be found watchful and faithful when you return. I pray this in the precious name of Jesus and for his sake. Amen. We pray you've been edified by this presentation. You've been listening to pastor, Bible teacher, and author David Harrell. For more information or to order additional tapes or CDs of Pastor Harrell's messages, please visit olivetreeresources.org.